Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Yeah. Hallelujah. New Year to get started with yeah. the Word of God. Hallelujah. And a new year to, to let God mold us yeah. and shape us and, and trim away the, the spiritual fat and get us ready to go. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory. So let's pray and let's jump into Sunday school. Yes. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for this day. This is your day, the day that the Lord has made. Father, so let us be glad and let us rejoice in it. <clears throat> Father, that as we begin this new year, Lord, that you draw us closer to yourself. Yes, Father, Lord. Yes. reveal yourself to us in, in a more intimate way. Lord, as, as we strive, That's Father, right. yes, to be God. more like Jesus. Yes. Father, as we get into the word this morning, Father, let it open up to us. Father, let it speak to us. Let it challenge us. Let it encourage us. But most of all, Lord, let it change us. Yes, Lord. And we give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Now, last time we were talking about what about Peter getting out of the boat, walking out to Jesus, and the fact that, that the reason he started sinking was because he took his eyes off Jesus and began looking at the circumstances around him. That's right. And when we take our eyes off of Jesus and we look at the circumstances around us, we fall. That's right. We begin to sink in the midst of those circumstances instead of allowing God to pull us through to keep us walking in that. So as as Peter began to sink, he did the only thing that men can do that will get us out of that, that pit, and that's call out to Jesus. That's right, that's right. So that's where we left off. The fact that, that he that calling out to Jesus is the only thing that will get us out of our pit. Amen. Amen. That name, the name of Jesus, it's the name of Jesus is so controversial because it stirs up hmm. demons. Yes, it does. They hate the name of Jesus. Yes, it does. You, you can call on the name of Allah. You, you can call on Buddha and all these other people. It don't cause no kind of ruckus. No. But you speak the name of Jesus. Yeah. You begin calling on that name and, and things happen. Yes, yes. The, the spiritual forces in high places begin to shake and tremble. And, and that is the only name that will get us out of, of where we are at, That's where right. we find ourselves. That's right. So as we're going to go down now. We're, we're on page 10, and we're getting ready. Jesus, he does, when Peter calls out to him, he does what he does for all who call on his name in sincerity. He immediately yes, reaches he down mm -hmm. and pulls Peter from sinking. And, and we've talked about this before. Anytime they put that word immediately in, that don't mean that, that he was like, well, I guess I'll get Peter. No, he uh, reached down and grabbed yeah. him yes, and picked did. him up. Yes, he, did. <laughs> he immediately reacts to those who call out to him in desperation. And sometimes I think that's where people have to get to before they will call on Jesus. Most people, it takes them getting to rock bottom yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. before they'll call out on the name mm -hmm. of Jesus. Sincerely. Yeah. yeah. The, the name of Jesus, that's that nice little name that we can say when we say our prayer our, our rote prayer at night. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take in Jesus' name. Amen. That's a nice little prayer. And that's a nice little Jesus in Jesus' name. But that's not calling out to Jesus in desperation. Even that prayer, unless it is said with a sincerity in heart, means nothing. Right. You can say all you want to say, but if it don't come from the heart, it's it it's prayed in vain. Yes. Yes. It defiles the temple of God. That's right. 
and he doesn't accept it. But Jesus does what he does for any who call on his name. Psalm 161, the psalmist writes, I love the Lord. Yes, sir. Yeah, mm. those, those four words right there yes, at that very beginning. I love the Lord. Yes, sir. And then he tells us why. Because he has heard my voice That's right. That's and right. my supplications. Because he has inclined his ear to me. Yeah. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. Not just sometimes. Not just when I'm in trouble. Not just when there's doubt. Not just when things are against me. But I'll call on him as long as I live. That's right. That's right. Because when I did call out to him in my desperation, he heard me and he pulled me out. Yeah. Therefore, every day. I'm going to call out to him because I need him every day. I don't just need him when I'm in trouble. That's right. See, way too many believers, they keep Jesus in their hip pocket for, for when, when a rainy day comes, when, when trouble comes. That's not the relationship he wants. In fact, he doesn't even honor that relationship. That's right. Again, it defiles his name. So he says, I, I will call upon him as long as I live. In verse 3, it says, the pains of death surrounded me. Uh -huh. And the pains of Sheol laid hold of me. Uh -huh. I found trouble and sorrow. Remember a couple weeks ago when we were talking about the 23rd Psalm. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Uh -huh. And here he's saying, the pains of death surrounded me. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. The pains of sin, let, let's put it in this context. The wages of sin is death. Mm -hmm. So when we're living in sin, we're constantly walking in death's shadow. That's right, that's right. Because it's waiting uh -huh. for its opportunity. But he says, when I was in those pains, when I felt that, he pulled me out. He what surrounded me and yes. pulled me out. Yes. When the grave was ready to receive me, was ready to reach up and snatch me, he, he held on to me. Uh -huh. In verse 4, he says, then I called upon the name of the Lord. Oh, Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul, yes, not sir. my body. That's right. Deliver yes, my soul. Yes, sir. He's not saving your body. That's right. That's right. My flesh is flesh. It's of this world. Uh -huh. He wants my soul because it's eternal. So he said, deliver my soul. Verse 5, gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. He's gracious. He's righteous. He's merciful. But he's also just. Mm -hmm. yes, That's why is. I say if you're not, if you're not crying out to him, if, if the heart has to be crying out, yeah. not the lips, bless you, Thanks. not the lips. Because those who honor God with just their lips and not their heart, again, they defile his name. That's right. And he doesn't honor that. But he is gracious and merciful to those who call out to him and seek after his righteousness. In verse 6, the Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low and he saved me. He preserves the humble. Yes. If we stay humble before the Lord, if we're walking in him and we stay humble before him, he preserves us. Yes, he does. Yes, he he, does. He's, got, he's got that preservative that can't go bad <laughs> that he puts on us. <laughs> like, like people cure him, he cures us. Yes, he mm -hmm. does. But eventually, you know, Ham's going to go bad. Mm -hmm. Not with the pres preservative he uses. Right. It's eternal. It's, it's going to keep us there. He saved me. Verse 7, he says, Return to your rest, O my soul. From death, my tears, from my fear, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. Oh, wait, I jumped ahead. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. Mm -hmm. Again, the Lord doesn't save just a little bit. When the Lord saves, he saves all the way. 
He don't do it halfway. He's bountiful in his in say, his say, salvation. Say, yes, He's sir. bountiful in his grace. Yeah. He's bountiful in his deliverance. Because he does it fully. Man tries to save himself and he can't do it. In pieces. Yeah. Yeah. He just wants to get parts of his life right. Mm -hmm. The rest of it he wants, he's like, no, no, no. I like this part. No, God says. He, he's bountiful. He saves the whole thing. Yes, he he's does. going deep. He's going into the hallways, into the corners, into the corridors, into the closets of our heart, and he's cleaning it all out. Amen. Amen. He does what they call him the cleaning business. Deep cleaning. Yes, yes, yes. He does a deep cleaning. So, and he goes on in verse 8, For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. Oh. So my soul was dying. No, my soul was dead. We were, before Jesus, we were part of the walking dead. I tell you, amen. We were zombies, amen. spiritual zombies Just in this like world. That. Just like that, yeah. But now he has brought us from death. Our, our eyes those tears that we've cried out in, in, in sorrow and in grief and, and in repentance, now he wipes those away. And, and any tears we shed now are tears of joy. That's right. That's right. And he keeps our feet from falling. Amen. Amen. Uh, if, there's an if to that, though. <clears throat> if I abide in him. That's right. If I'm not abiding in him, he ain't going to knock me back in the right way. No, he's not. He's going to let me do what I want to do. Yeah. But he does. That's why in verse 9 he says, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Uh -huh. So Peter did what anyone who, who's in desperation does. He called out on the name of Jesus. And Jesus does what only he can do. When people call out his name, and that is to reach down and grab him and pull him up. Amen. Amen. And he's waiting for us. There are so many, and I'm going to clarify this. I, I was, the other day, I was in my hotel room and I was praying and I was studying. And I was thinking, you know, I was like, Lord, this thing is, is in, in this spirit that is invading the body of Christ. And he said, wait a minute. It's invading the church, not the body of Christ, because they're different. See, the church is not the body of Christ. The church is operated on man's plans, man's guidelines, man's directives. The body of Christ, where the true believers are, which is in the church, is not part of the church. The church is apostate. Church has moved itself into a, an apostate state. Okay. The body of Christ has not. That's right. The true body of Christ is still pure. That's right. And they're the ones who are holding on to truth and, and speaking it boldly. The, the church has moved itself away. Look at what's going on in the church. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's not the body of Christ. No. Now the body of Christ is within it, trying to, trying to, to wake those people up, and it's pure. But the church is separate from the body of Christ. It used to not be, but now it has it has pulled itself away from the body of Christ okay. and become an institution of man, not of God. Amen. Amen. Does that make sense? Yeah. Do, you, do you understand that? That, that kind of clarifies when we talk about the church and, and the true church. If, you, if we say the church and the body of Christ, then we can make a pure and clean distinction. Because the body of Christ is always pure. Yes, it is. The body of Christ is always holy. Yes, sir. Yes, the body sir. of Christ is always seeking after yes. righteousness. Yes. The church, however, she's a harlot. She chases after everything. Yeah. She has many lovers. Yeah. Many, many. <laughs> and she entices them to come in. Uh -huh. She gives her wares to draw her lovers in. Uh -huh. 
carnal means, drawing carnal men into the church, yeah. and they continue to use carnal means to keep them. That's harlotry. In fact, that's not even being a prostitute because a prostitute takes money yeah. for for harlotry. But but the harlot gives money to get people to come and do what she wants done. So that's I just wanted to make that distinction. Here, but, but Jesus reached down and pulled him up. And then Jesus rebuked Peter for not keeping his eyes on him. I love this. Jesus has a way. Even, even when we call out to him and he pulls us up out of whatever mess we've gotten ourselves into, it doesn't keep him from chastising his children, from chastising his sheep. Every good shepherd is going to discipline his sheep. That's right. So that's what he does. The source and he, he, for not keeping his eyes on him, Jesus is the source and foundation of our faith. And he rebukes his lack of faith. And this is something he dealt with the disciples the whole time he was teaching them. Yeah. You would think after three and a half years... He wouldn't have to keep getting on to them about their lack of faith. But it was a consistent thing with them up until the day of Pentecost. So Jesus chastises him. And, and James tells us this. He says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. And it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting. Mm -hmm. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded mm -hmm. and unstable in all his ways. Mm -hmm. what, was, what was Peter's problem? He lost hope. He, he, yeah, yeah, he doubted. Yeah. He got to looking around him, seeing the circumstances, and he doubted Jesus' ability to keep him up. Well, that that's the same way that um, the new converts, the, some believers, and and even some new creatures do, because they they start remembering the mm -hmm. past. They start, you know, a lot of people cannot be blessed by God because they 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 think that okay, something is bad is getting ready to happen. Mm -hmm. If good is there, the, the first thing come to them is something bad is getting ready to happen to me. Right. This can't be. So therefore, same with like Peter. Peter's faith, he doubted because of his circumstance. He began to see his his things, his situations going on between the word that Jesus spoke, come, faith. Mm -hmm. He saw yeah. his stuff. And that's the same way it is with, with, with every believer. That's why we have to be able to do the things that, that, that is required of the word of God for us to do and strive in that, you know, right. continue to strive in it because it's going to be hard yeah. because we're so used to living in sin. Yeah, that's our default. You know, we always talk about this. Sin is man's default programming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because in the garden, we got hacked. <laughs> We got hacked big time in the garden. Mm -hmm. and, and the devil messed up that, that base program that was holiness in the yeah. beginning. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was purity. But he got in there and, and he he entered a virus into our yeah. program. Try to put this so so you all on social media, if you're if you're into that kind of thing, hopefully you can understand this a little bit better. Satan entered a virus into God's perfect program. Yeah. And that virus was sin, which leads to death. So now that is man's default. We always, man always without Christ goes back to sin. So, so yeah, Peter doubted Jesus gets on to him because you doubted my ability and you took your eyes off of me. When you take your eyes off of Jesus, it gives doubt an open door to come in. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. When we take our eyes off of Jesus, it opens up the door for all kind of crazy stuff. Uh -huh. yeah.
to come in and begin to mess with us. Thoughts about our past. Yep. The devil loves to bring up your past. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. God didn't save you. God can't, can't keep you. God, God can't honor you and what you're doing because you did this and you did this and you did. God don't see that devil. When, when God looks at me, he sees the blood of Christ, so leave me alone. I got my eyes on Jesus. He's the author and the foundational per person of my faith. And I'm going to keep my eyes on him. Amen. You can talk all the junk you want to talk, but that ain't remembered no more because it's under the blood. That's right. That's right. I have a mediator. I have the best attorney in e all eternity That's right. that, that has gone before the judge on my behalf and, and paid lost. my debt. And never lost the case. And never lost, and never the, case. lost the case. <laughs> yeah. He's like Perry Mason. He don't lose. I'm trying to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> you can think you got him down, but he's victorious. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. <laughs> so then Jesus, Jesus, they get back to the boat and the disciples. Now, now here's something cool about this. And I've seen it before, but it kind of jumped out this time. The wind and the waves were still going on while Jesus was walking on the water. Yeah. And when he called Peter out to him, as soon as they got in the boat, it stopped. Yeah. Now, he could have done that before he got there. <laughs> yeah. So that he, the disciples wasn't in that boat thinking, we're going to die. Mm -hmm. But he waited. Because he wanted them again to understand. I'm the one that calms the storm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm the one who brings peace. Yes, yes. And when they saw that, they worshipped him and declared that he is the son of God. See, when you see the hand of Jesus in it, there is no recourse but to worship him and declare that he is who he says he is. Because he is God. He's not almost God. He's not like God. He is God. Yes, sir. And he calmed the sea. Peter's probably sitting there, why didn't you do that before, before I sunk? <laughs> you know, I didn't see this in Peter's mind going, Oh, now you calm it down. <laughs> you, call, I, you call me out of the boat and let me walk in the storm. Now we're in the boat and you're going to calm it down. But then he doesn't remember. I told you to call me out in the storm. <laughs> See, sometimes we got to think, if you ain't ready for the Lord to call you, you best not tell him, Lord, call me to come. Yeah, yeah. Because when you call him to tell you to come, he ain't waiting for the storm to die down. He still waits. <laughs> he says, come. There's a lot of people who want to be in ministry. And they tell the Lord, call me, tell me to come. And the Lord says, okay, come. And they get out the boat and they're like, yeah, that was a bad idea. <laughs> because the storm's just getting started. It's been raging, but look around us today and you see this, this spiritual storm that is going on around us in this world is, is turning into to a category five spiritual hurricane. And the Lord is calling us, come. And if you keep your eyes on me, I'm going to send you out into the storm so that you can do the work of the kingdom and you can drag others up out of the waves, out of this, this tempest that's going on and lead them to the boat where it's calm. Because once you get them in my boat, once you get them where I'm at, that storm's going to calm down in their spirit. That's right. 
See how we, these things are so relevant. If we look at it, not just in, well, the Bible says Jesus walked on the water. He called G, uh, Peter. Peter went out and, and got scared and started sinking, and Jesus picked him up, and they got in the boat and the storm. No, that's about, about spiritual life, too. It's a deeper meaning. There's a reason why Matthew put this in here. There's a reason for all of the things that the gospel writers tell us. Because everything that takes place, if you look at it in a deeper way, you see Jesus working even now in your and my life. Yeah. And in the life of all those who will look to him. And give us a direction to go to try and get others into the lifeboat. Because the Lord don't want anyone to drown. No, he doesn't. He wants them all to be saved and to come to safety. To where even, even in the midst of worldly storms, they can get in this spiritual lifeboat and it's calm. Your spirit can be calm and at peace and still even in a storm. Does that make sense? Amen. Amen. Okay, part five, touching the king's robe. So Matthew chapter 14, verse 34. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. When the men of that place recognized him, they set out into all the surrounding region, brought to him all who were sick, and begged him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched it were made perfectly well. Mark tells it like this in Mark 6.53. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there. When they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him. See, Mark puts that word in there. Those folks, it didn't take them long to recognize Jesus. When Jesus is in the house, people recognize him. Yes, they do. When Jesus shows up on the scene, everything changes. And the people recognized him. They ran through that whole surrounding region and be began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he entered into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplace and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made well. The king of the, the hem of the king's robe is the that's the power of just his presence. They didn't need him to physically reach down and, and touch them. They didn't need him to speak a word over them. All they had to do was reach up and touch his presence. Because just that presence is like the shadow. That's all you need is to get in his presence and things change. If men would understand this, this is the simplicity of the wonder of Jesus. Amen. We try to make things so complicated. Man, man messes everything up. Yes, it does. He deep. The, the simplicity of what Jesus does for us uh -huh. and the simplicity of how we get to him baffles man. That's yes. why they make man makes it so complicated. Yes, There's got to be more to it than this. Yeah. No, it says yeah. they just took him and laid him down and said, can we just, we just want, just walk by and we'll reach out and touch your garment. You don't even have to speak to me because I know if I can just touch your presence, yeah. Yeah. it's going to change my life. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't need a word, Jesus. I just need a touch. Yeah. And this happens in many places. The woman with the issue of blood in Mark 5, 25 through 34 says that she knew she had spent all her money on doctors and doctors couldn't stop her blood. That's right. So she got down, we've talked about this before, she got down, took herself through the mire and the muck of between all the people's feet just to get to the hem of his garment. Mm -hmm. 
and touched his garment because she knew if she could just touch the hem of that garden, garment, her life would be changed. Mm -hmm. And when she did, Jesus felt power go out from him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What kind of faith does that take? Simple. Strap. Yeah. Simple. I see the, I see him, mm -hmm. but there's all these people there. Yeah. But if I can get there, mm -hmm. that's my that's my goal. And she got down and crawled through all the stuff mm -hmm. just to get to him. Are we willing to do that? Not many believers are willing to do that. Crawling through the steps of our life. Yeah. You know, not not you know, that was her example. Right. You know, to stop that issue of blood. But can we see ourselves crawling through, you know, the situations of our lives, the issues to yeah. get to touch the hem of his garment? Yeah. What are we willing to, to sacrifice yeah. and pay to get yeah. to Jesus? The friends lowering their 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 buddy down through the ceiling, punching a hole in somebody's house to get it get him in front of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's simplicity in itself. Yeah. All they had to do is dig a hole and drop him down in. Mm -hmm. They weren't worried about, we're going to have to fix this afterwards. Yeah. They worry about that later. Right now, we need to get our friend to Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are we willing to do that for our friend? What does that mean? Are we willing to hurt their feelings, maybe? Yeah. To get them to see the truth? Yeah. Are we willing to offend them yep. to get them to see the truth? Yeah. Are we willing to tell them that the way they're going is not the way yeah. Yeah. to get eternal life? See, they were willing to do something to get him to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The leper. We only see this guy for a few verses, but he's one of my favorite people in the whole New Testament because you only see him for a few verses, but yet what happens with him is so profound that people just jump over it and miss it. Yeah. The fact that this is a guy who had to run around with a bell hollering unclean, unclean, wherever he went, so people could clear a path so they didn't have to touch his leprosy. Yeah. And yet he comes to Jesus and he says, if you're willing to speak the word and I'll be made whole. And Jesus had compassion on him and reached out and touched him. Yeah, yeah. He did what nobody else would do. changed his life and that's what Jesus asked of us what is it you want me to do if you're willing just speak the word and I'll be healed you don't have to touch me that's right that's right because I know that your word controls creation there's two men beside the road in Matthew 20 that are hollering out, Son of David, heal us. And Jesus heals them. Time and the Syrophoenician woman who comes to him, whose, whose daughter is dying. And he says, Lord, she's asked him to heal her daughter. He's like, look, I came to Israel. Uh -huh. I didn't come to give, to give the gifts or, or the good stuff to dogs and she's like right. look even dogs get the crumbs off the master's table mm -hmm. and he's like you know what that's great faith you're not you're not even you're not mad because you're not one of Israel and that I'm not going to give you the whole thing oh you just want a little bit your faith and it's what he tells her your faith is so great your daughter's healed yeah. And in that same hour, she was healed. Lord, I just need a crumb. It's just a little bit. That's all it takes from you. Just uh -huh. a little bit. And 
things change. Because that little bit is everything from heaven. Uh -huh. That's that bounty of heaven. The little, one drop of Jesus' blood transforms and cleanses a life. You don't have to take a shower in it. You just need a drop. That's it. And you're saved completely. <laughs> the, the, all the bounty and grace of heaven is in one drop of blood. Yeah, yeah. Simplicity of it. And there's many, many others. You can go through the gospel and you can see all of these times when all people needed was just to be in the presence of the one who created them. Yes, yes. And he changed their life. Can't we grasp that? Yes, yes we can. <laughs> we, we, and, and believers are, believers, we're hard-headed sometimes. Because we, we think, oh, Lord, i got to do all of this other stuff I, I, to, in order to get to you. Well, yes and no. There are some things we need to sacrifice. Sometimes it takes personal sacrifice to get to a place, not to where the Lord acts, but where we're ready to receive what he's trying to, to do for us. That's right. Being living sacrifices our whole life, our, our whole being, heart, mind, body, spirit, everything about us. Going without, the, uh, keeping myself restricted from things that, that keep me off of focus from him for, for a time. To when I do draw near to him. So now we're moving in to... to Chapter 15. Now, chapter 15, I'm going to tell y'all. Chapter 15 starts off with a hammer. Yeah. <laughs> Part one is doctrines of God over doctrines of men. Jesus jumps right into this one, man, with both feet. Uh, and, and as we ended last, the last chapter, Talking about those coming to Jesus to touch just the hem of his garment. Garment. Jesus is the healer. He's the deliverer. He's the mighty Savior. When he walks by, it changes everything. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. So now we get to the showdown between the scribes and Pharisees and Jesus. This is like uh, the, the spiritual gunfight at the OK Corral here. Yeah. between the scribes and Pharisees and Jesus. Because in 15.1, look at what the scribes and Pharisees say. The scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus. They came all the way to Gennesaret so they could, they could ask him this. Why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders. Now that that's an important thing there. Yeah. Yeah. The tradition of the elders. For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And he answered them saying, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God? Because of your tradition. Mm -hmm. For God commanded saying, Honor your father and your mother. And he who curses father or mother... Let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. Then he need not honor his father and mother. mother. Thus, you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Mm -hmm. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not about honoring father and mother. No, it's not. We can get that out of the way right up front. Jesus isn't talking, though That's we are to do that. He's making a different point. 
about this. These Jewish leaders always put themselves in a place where Jesus can address their lack of truly understanding the commandments and standards of God's word. They put themselves. You know, you ever know people who, who they just, they beg to be picked on because they always put themselves in a place. You know how friends are. There's always one guy in the group of friends who always says something or does something that everybody else just jumps on that and, and, and picks at them about it. Yeah, they ran yeah, that's what the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees and priests are like with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Every time they say something to him, they just line themselves up for him to just shoot them down. Yeah. And that shows how little they understand the commandments of God. Mm -hmm. Secondly, Jesus immediately takes their attack on the disciples not following the traditions of the elders and turns it back on them to show them how they place tradition above the word of God. Yeah. Yeah. That's important. Because the word of God, sola scriptura, scripture alone is our, is our foundation. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is where we find truth. That is where we find how we live for the Lord. Not traditions made by men. That's right. Third, Jesus exposes their teachings as doctrines of men or demons. We, you might as well put it, uh, just say it real. Any doctrines of men is doctrines of demons. That's yeah. right, that's right. Because yeah. they come from Satan. Yeah. Because God's already given us his doctrines. Yes, he has. Yes, he has. And he's not going to keep adding to them. That's right. So any doctrines that are added, those come from men, which means their basis is not of God. So they're doctrines of demons. He exposes their teaching of these over the doctrines of truth that comes only from the Lord, period. Period. You don't take the Bible plus this. You don't take the Bible plus this. Scripture alone. J.C. Ralph said it this way. What is the best safeguard against false doctrine? The Bible regularly read, regularly prayed over, and regularly studied. If you know the word of God, the truth, it's hard for false doctrine to mess you up. Better say that again. <laughs> if you know the truth, it's hard for false doctrine to mess you up. That's right. That's right. Max Anderson said exposure to false doctrine places a person at risk not just for theological error but for moral failure and that's true if I'm listening to the doctrines of men over the doctrines of God over his word I'm already failing morally because I have turned from the foundation the, the standard for truth there is only one truth and that's God's word. That's right. And R.C. Sproul's put it this way. No Christian can avoid theology. We all have theology. Every Christian has a theology. The issue then is not do we want to have a theology. That's a given. The real issue is do we have sound theology? Mm -hmm. Do we embrace true or false doctrine? In every age, the church is threatened by heresy. And heresy is bound up in false doctrine. Amen. It is the desire of all heretics to minimize the importance of doctrine. And when doctrine is minimized, heresy can exercise itself without restraint. That's right. I love that. That's right. That's right. We all, Christianity is based, every, some people say, oh, you don't need doctrine. No, you do. The Bible is doctrine. Yes, yes, yes. But it is, is it sound doctrine that yes. is based on the Bible or is it 
unsound doctrine that's heretical based on man's ideologies to try and justify his rebellion against God's word. See, and that's what, that's, that's the problem with the scribes and Pharisees. Uh -huh. day. They were building their own doctrine based on their desire to justify everything they did. Uh -huh. That's why he used the honor of your mother and father thing. He said, you know, the Bible says to honor your father and mother, but you say, if I tell my father and mother that what you would get from me, I'm giving to God, then I don't have to honor them because I'm giving it to the Lord. I'm giving it to, to a higher purpose than taking care of my mom and dad. That, that's what Jesus is saying that they're telling their parents. Oh, I know that this, I'm supposed to give this to you, but, but I'm giving it to God instead. So I don't have to honor you because I'm giving it to God. Yeah, yeah. Eh, wrong. All you're doing is saying, I won't give you nothing. So I, I took what I was going to give you. I took a little bit of that and gave it to the church. The rest of it I put back in my bank account. And I don't have to honor you. But it wasn't about that. He was just pointing out to them. This is how you twist true doctrine to your doctrine. To fit your, your desires, your passions, your lusts. You, you took what God commanded and, and you made it into something different. So Jesus confronts them about their progressive teaching. <laughs> and, and might as well call it what it is this progressive teaching it's the same thing that goes on in the church today Amen. they had by tradition made up their mind that if they gave to the Lord they no longer needed to provide for their parents he could have chosen many things to deal with them about but this is what he chose but he wanted to do this because it's a foundational principle See, family, taking care of family was a foundational principle of God's law. Uh -huh, uh -huh. As your parents took care of you when you're young, you take care of them when they're old. Yes. That's, that's just a, a biblical standard. That's God's idea. That's how he set it up. Uh -huh. But they twisted it. In fact, he turns the words which God has spoken through Isaiah to make his point. He says, hypocrites, right? Right off the bat. Notice, he always just, he throws that word out there. You're hypocrites. You people ain't got no sense. Like it don't mean nothing. Yeah. He says, well, did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So in vain they worship me teaching his doctrines, the commandments of men. In vain, if you're not living by truth, that's right, that's right. by the standard of truth, mm -hmm. anything you do is worthless. That's right, amen. It's defiled sacrifices. It's defiled worship. It's defiled giving. Because it's not done from a pure heart. Because they place their ideas and traditions above the word of God. Written and established in heaven. From everlasting to everlasting. Understand this. God's word. The standard that he set. Was written and established in heaven. From before the foundations of the world were laid. And for man to come and take that and change any of it is worthless. And it makes worship meaningless. Amen. Amen. See, the modern and progressive church needs to see and understand this. Today's church has, has this inclusiveness in the church today is not based on the standard of truth. Mm -hmm. 
It is based on man's ideology. That's why I say the church is a harlot. It, it's not the body of Christ. The body of Christ is within it. But, but the church herself, she sold, she's selling her wares to whoever will come by and giving herself to whomever will take her. She's an adulteress. This wasn't just a, a problem with the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees and the priests. This goes all the way back to the prophets and elders under Jeremiah and Ezekiel's day. You go back and read Jeremiah and Ezekiel and read it with a, with a vision of today's church and, and this nation. Yeah. You can see a parallel, a reflection mm -hmm. of, of our nation, the government of this nation, and, and the church within this nation today. You'll see a mirror image of it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how God, that's why this year... As we begin to, to talk about rewarded faithfulness and truth, we're going to be hammering these things. That's right. That's right. Because God is tired of his, of his people, those who are supposed to be his people, prostituting themselves to everything but him. We're supposed to be his bride. And a bride doesn't run around messing with everybody else. <laughs> and this was an issue also that was found with the fledgling newborn church. Look in Galatians 1.6. Paul tells them, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. The church hadn't even gotten out of the starting blocks. And she's already beginning to have an adulterous affair with false teaching. He goes on, he says, you're, you're giving yourself to a different gospel, which is not another. In other words, Anything other than the gospel, number one, is not a gospel. If it's not based on the foundational truth of God's word, it's not the gospel. It's something else. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Oh, how do they pervert it? Well, these are Judaizers. They want to add something to it. And he goes on, but even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be anathema, let him be a curse. That's right. That's right. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be anathema, let him be a curse. <laughs> even if an angel... Mm -hmm. mm, <clears throat> Excuse me. Do we have any angels trying to tell us a different gospel? Think about it. Think about it. What, what was... Who, who fell with Lucifer? Third of the angels. And he is an angel of light. That's right. So if he comes to us as an angel of light, wouldn't that fit the, the profile of an angel trying to preach a different gospel? Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, Paul's, Paul, he's, he's trying to say, look, you got to be careful. Because there are people who look right, but they ain't. And even if I myself who preach this gospel to you that you got saved come back to you and I've added something to it mm -hmm. or took something away from it, let me be a curse too. That's right. That's right. 
Because now I'm not preaching the gospel. I'm preaching something else. And what the Judaizers were doing, they were saying, first, you have to enter into the, the, um, into the commandments of Judaism or under the, the practices of Judaism before you can get Jesus. In other words, you had to get circumcised before you could get saved. Mm -hmm. That's adding an act of works to justification by faith. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, we're saved by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone. Nothing else. There's nothing added to it. That's right. Faith, grace, and Christ. Mm -hmm. To add circumcision to that. Then you start adding other things. You have to keep the Sabbath. You can't eat pork. You, you see how the slippery slope this gets on? Mm -hmm. Then you start adding things. Keep going down here. The simplicity of the gospel. The simplicity of it makes it to where anyone can understand it and come to it and be transformed. When you start making it difficult, people can't get saved. Yeah. They have a form of salvation, but or a form of godliness that, that's not true. Because the power of the gospel is that by faith, through grace, in Christ, <coughs> I'm saved. Period. I don't need anything else. 1 Timothy 4.1 Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. There are those who start out right. Even preachers who start out right. And somewhere down the line <coughs> this looks like a good idea. We can get all kind of people to come to church if we do this. Yeah. No, preach the word. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need programs. Everybody wants programs. Even the world has programs yeah. that they offer now, the ministries, the churches and mm -hmm. stuff. So to see if, they, you know, to help them get more members, to right. help them be more attractive to others. Yeah, and how do we do that? We change the gospel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We weaken it. If you weaken the gospel, people will come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you weaken it, if you make, if there's no repentance in it, if we don't talk yeah. about sin, no if we make it attractive and palatable, yeah. Jesus loves you. He's got a plan for your life. He wants to bless you. He wants to give you all this stuff. That's attractive, but you've detracted because you've taken the, the sin and the repentance out of it. Yes, Jesus wants to, to, to bless you, maybe not in the terms that you're thinking, but he can't do that until you realize, number one, you're a sinner. You're walking dead. You're a spiritual zombie, and you yeah. need to be saved, which comes when I repent and say, Lord, I've been rebelling against you and your word, trying to do it my way. I've been God of my life, not you. So I repent of that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then, when, when he washes me and cleanses me and sanctifies me and justifies me and seals me with the Holy Spirit, then he can bless me. Yeah, yeah. But I can't Take those two requirements out of the gospel and it still be the gospel. It's something else. It's palatable and people will flock to it. But they ain't getting saved. Or very few of them are. Because they still don't believe they're a sinner. That's right. That's right. They make mistakes. 
I slip up once in a while. So that's what I mean by, by that making it palatable. We can't do that. That's a deceiving spirit. That's a doctrine of demons because it, it takes out two of the primary bases for salvation that I understand. I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. And that I need to, to, to be sorrowful and repent of my rebellion against God. If I take those two things out of the salvation message, out of the gospel message, it is no longer the gospel. All it is is a good feeling sermon that says, just come on in and settle down and, and God will bless you. You'll get yourself eventually. Yeah. So that's that's a doctrine of deceiving. We'll we'll stop here for this morning. But but do you see see where we're going with this? This is Jesus is trying to get, and this is something that the Lord is is wanting to start this year off with us, is to get us to understand there is a standard of truth. There is a gospel that is true, but there is a lot of other gospels that are not because they're not the gospel. They sound good, and, and they draw people in, but they're not changing anyone. Yeah. Right. All they're doing is getting them to think God's a good daddy. He's going to give me stuff. That's it. And if I just keep on thinking and keep on speaking this over my life, he's going he's to do it. No. Mm -hmm. That's not the way it goes. Questions, comments before we pray? Lord God, again, we thank you, Father, for this day. We thank you for your word. Father, as we move into the service this morning, Lord, continue to lead us and guide us. May everything that we do glorify Jesus. Lord, may we be a light in this world of darkness. Father, that we see lives changed and transformed in this year. And we give you thanks for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.